Um, so I'm Jeanette Maser. I'm uh, the America's Managing Director for WCN, uh, which is a talent acquisition tech company. But I really consider myself one, one of you guys. So I spent almost my entire career as a practitioner, um, actually focusing on campus recruiting, college recruiting. Uh, first at Lehman Brothers before they went under, and then before joining WCN, I was at Credit Suisse as the global COO of um, campus recruiting. So, and then I decided, well, forget about Wall Street. Really move over to, to the tech side, and it's a lot more fun. So I come to you today to talk about big data, but really wearing that practitioner hat versus, but with a little bit of tech as well, just because that's what I've been doing. So um, let me just, okay. So um, quickly, I just, in case people are like, what's WCN? I'm going to do like a 30 second, you know, commercial, if you will. Uh, my head of sales told me to say that. Um, so just <laughs> quickly, we're a public company, you know, global, uh, headquartered in London. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm based in New York, and you know, again, as I said, talent acquisition, tech, tech suite of company, you know, tech company. Been around tons of clients, big names like NBC and um, BlackRock, and <laughs> I just think it's really fun. Um, but uh, you know, everyone in London is like, oh, big deal. I'm like, no. So cool. <laughs> so, um, so just quickly, we have a whole suite of products around um, talent acquisition. So everything from what we were talking about earlier, like it's not just when the candidate applies, um, it's about starting to engage with them beforehand, whether it's events at college and engaging with them, or their you know, product when they're actually applying, and then we have to interview them. And, you know, so it's an interview schedule or all the way through, and you know, you're managing your interns. Mobility is about uh, you know managing internal mobility. And, Things like that, and then we have intelligence, which is our um, big data piece, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, but more of just in, in theory as well. So just like sort of quickly about that, and then again, really quickly, we have all sorts of tailored solutions, whether it's for college recruiting, we're really big in high volume, uh, diversity, veteran. So again, just a quick taster. I can talk later. That's, that's my my question. Okay. So um, okay, so let's talk about artificial intelligence. And big data, and so it was interesting. I am um, sort of like this huge geek, and I read Harvard Business Review. So this past fall, <laughs> and is you know, shaking your head like, yes, you probably saw this article in September. And literally, I'm going to read this out. I hate reading slides, but I am going to read this out. So it says, studies have shown that while humans can provide useful input, algorithms do a better job in the role of final decision maker, uh, which is really amazing. Uh, when you think about that. If I think about big data and artificial intelligence, like we're using this so much in our everyday lives right now. So one way I've avoided tons of fights with my husband is please, please, uh, their <laughs> algorithm. Like, so now we argue which is the fastest way to get to the airport. And, you know, I like to go down you know, one highway, he likes the other. Well, what do we do now to avoid the fight? We just plug in the address and ways, ways tells us. Using their algorithm, you know, using all the different data points, so I know stuff, and I like to go up. We can, we're, we're done, right? Like it just is, <laughs> and so it's these easy, simple things that we're using everyday lives. Like think about another good example is like Amazon, you know, which I'm obsessed about. You know, Packages every day. I don't even go to the stores anymore. You know, Amazon is using things that I bought to give you really good recommendations that they think I'm going to want to buy. So how are they doing that? They're using big data and algorithms. They're using buying, purchasing past behavior, they're using all the orders and they're doing all sorts of, you know, data crunching with data scientists to give us, you know, really great recommendations. So again, it's like part of our everyday life right now. So well why do we think, you know, let's well, what about recruiting? Like how can this apply to recruiting? So my first question, raise a hand. Is anyone using big data, artificial intelligence? So my first question is like Raise your hand here. What was big data? It's okay. <laughs> okay, so for those on live stream, no one's raising their hand, but that's okay. Okay, so next question. Is anyone just beginning to use any sort of big data type of thing? And they're on. No one is raising their hand. So then no one clearly has a step. So this is good. So we're gonna talk about big data and how you can use it or think about using it. So um, and again, so let me just talk about like, well, why? So, well, why, you know, we call it intelligence at WCN, artificial intelligence big data. So we have some clients that, you know, and, and more like we think about campus recruiting, we we're talking about school recruiting, that they need to hire, you know, um, 3,000 people, um, college students, and like they get 150,000 applications. I mean, you know, 
the, the college recruiting season for them is like crunched into you know like a couple of months. So it's like, well, how do they do that? You know, how, how do other organizations? What if I said you know you want to hire fifty superstars? Let's say fifty superstar diverse you know, people before your before your you know competitors like. That would be interesting on live big data, you know, or what about like, forget about the first 50, like I want to get another 50 that like, I'm not even looking at now, and like my competitors aren't even looking at either, like, well that sounds, you know, again, more interesting, um, or again, very specifically, let's hire like more to match, you know, our, our, our community, whether it's, you know, let's not make you know, 50% gender, diversity, however it's defined. Just a side note, we were talking, you know, earlier with different areas of diversity, a lot of areas I'm hearing now around diversity, new areas around socioeconomic, socioeconomic diversity as well. So I'm going to just touch on that a little bit later as well, but it just, just something to think about in the back of your mind, just other, other ways. Um, how can you recruit in days but versus months, you know, weeks, etc.? Like, or, you know, I would say if you could make data stay in your team, like, 30% of the time. Um, so what, you know, what we have, so it's interesting, so tell me some you developed a big data algorithm that right now will predict the instant accounting applies um, with 90% like accuracy, a third of those people that someone's going to want to hire. This is just for like the college early career type of, uh, type of uh, application. So experience hiring, we were talking about, we were talking about like a target, some of the tech stuff where the more established algorithm does not work, but for our campus recruiting, um, organizations like imagine I mean, so, so like take a step back if you imagine like the second a candidate applies if you had an algorithm you had a recommendation that said you know what there's like a probability that you're going to want to hire this candidate with, like 95 percent probability like think about that like and how that might change what your the way you interact with that candidate or fast track or think about it, like so we're talking about applications but you think about that from an, an engagement standpoint if they're starting to engage with you or they're going to an event and, I don't know, I'm like looking at all the lawyers in the room so my like, it's your turn to like, oh my god like you can't exactly do it. but 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 if you start to think about like how you you know instantly if you had this information about a candidate that you were likely to hire them or likely to give them an offer or likely to you know really start to change the way your process works. So we, you know, we think things like that is a game changer, whether it's an algorithm or in other companies or they're doing stuff, but like think about artificial intelligence. And so and let's talk about, I have four examples of like where this could be a real game changer and how you think about artificial intelligence and overlaying it into your recruiting process. So what? Connect and engage with candidates first. So if you have a candidate, you know, again, that applies, and if we think of, you know, campus recruiting where you have instantly, you know, if you have an issue with tons of applications from, you know, certain schools you're going to, if you instantly knew the second that that candidate applied, that, again, a huge percentage of probability we're going to end up hiring them, or certainly, you know, interviewing them, you could do so many different things. You could start to engage with that. Like maybe again, you know, looking at the lawyers that are like, you know, because you want to have that like very specific process. But if you had a very specific process, you could start to maybe invite them right away to an interview. You could start to have like a special dinner with them to engage with them. Like there it's all about again connecting with them first before your competitors do and developing a relationship with them. So when it's time to actually make them that offer, they're gonna to want to choose you. So before you know, your competitors, so you think about like you're talking about, is it MIT or, or so, whatever the school? So okay, everyone's going there. So great, but what if you could get to those candidates first, the second they apply, and then you know, well, you've got to do an interview process, but after you anonymize everything, like again, so I think like think about that again, speed, and that you know, and, and people are starting to use this, so it's only going to get more and more and more. So you got to think about this in your recruiting process. So speed. So we were talking about schools that you don't go to and earlier other sources and whatnot. So a lot of things that I hear from people that, you know, whether we work with or, or, or not, is that, you know, I want to go to other schools, but I'm worried, or I have other sources, but I'm worried I'm going to get so many so many applications, or I only go to these schools, and you know, again, there's this worry of like you know, these pools of candidates that people aren't connecting with. And so 
if you have a way to easily sort through all these applications in a really fast way, you're not going to leave anyone behind. So there's certain sources you know, like we were saying, okay, that, that company knows Stanford really well, but they don't trust the MIT or they don't trust the state schools. But if you had a very specific way of looking look at everyone the same way, then that's more data and evidence. So let, let me take a step back for a second. So here's a question. 60% of Fortune 1000 CEOs graduated from how many different universities? Ten. Raise your hand if you think it's 15. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five people. So, yeah, so, so uh, two thirds of them that. Raise your hand if you think it's 75. Maybe 10% of the room. What about 250? There's, there's, there's one in the room. So I think <laughs> some people in the room have seen this. this that before, because usually I get the opposite. It's actually, it's 15. It's 15 universities. So we were talking about earlier where it's like, we're only going to certain schools. What about all these amazing candidates outside your core schools, your target schools, that, you know, at University of, you know, of nowhere, where I don't recruit at? You know, what about these great <laughs> candidates? You know, like, they're the cream and the crop. If you had a way where that when they actually applied, instead of them going to this Black hole, because that's what happens a lot of times if you are getting applications. Get, and maybe that's not just schools, maybe there's different sources. They're going into this black hole. Get, if you have a way, we can typically identify who the, you know, again, high likelihood of you hiring them or interviewing them. You're not going to be in that black hole anymore. So I think there's a there's this huge opportunity to use artificial intelligence to expand your sources and look beyond. And don't let, you know, that, like, I have this picture of, like, no child left behind. Like, what is that from, like, the the uh, But it's that kind of thing. Like, don't let any of these big candidates get left behind because you don't have a process set up to go through all of your applications. And whatnot. I mean, obviously, that's more for someone who has a ton of applications. If you're not getting so many, well, then, you know, we need to talk about that issue. But this is where, you know, we have too many candidates. So, Big thing why we're here: reduce bias, reduce bias. So we've talked about it was like this. <laughs> this is the perfect setup. So you know, there is this unconscious bias in our selection process, and if you have an algorithm like, so we've taken out like all these all these pieces out of the algorithm, out of our algorithm. So it's not even looking at diversity. It's not like you can tune it in a way where it takes literally the algorithm takes out all this implicit bias or all there was like ten different biases. You pull that out, and a machine can actually just decide, like in an unbiased way. That's huge because you know it's you've just taken that whole human bias out, and so that's that's a huge piece. And so um, it, you know it's it, it's interesting, and I have you know sort of a, a slide later on that, that we'll talk about. Is like you know one you know one day is it going to be where you know we need to use it from a legal standpoint? So right now, like you know, lawyers are like. Oh, this you know, artificial intelligence, that, you know, but um, like it could be down the road where we're going to say, you know what, like this is the better way to do your selection process. The algorithm does a better way. It's not biased. Like, like we could be in a world one day. We're like, of course you have to use like you have to use an algorithm. You have to use the computer to make this because it's going to make better decisions for you. And if you don't use it, that could be you know you could make yourself illegal hot water. So you know again. If you're taking it out and you have these great candidates, so we, for example, with the, the, the Jamal and the Greg, you know, Algorithm doesn't care what your name is, doesn't care what, you know, where, any of the diversity, right? It's just going to, based on, you know, hundreds of thousands of different data points, it's going to say, this person, taking out any of that bias, has a high likelihood, 90% likelihood of getting it all. There's none of that. Like, I mean, what was the percentage? Like, you know, that we, all that goes away. It just go away, right? Fine tuning out rather than doing it the, the right way. So again, that's like a huge area uh, that artificial intelligence can help. And then time. So you know, one thing we haven't you know, talked about as well, but if, if you are spending time um, Looking at all you know, all these applications and screening them and, and whatnot. Like it's you know, I think we we, we did. If you'll say if you have ten recruiters on your team and they you know to get through all the applications. Let's say an example of campus recruiting two months of like screening applications. 
and automatically an algorithm can just say, hey, you know, we think these are the ones you should look at. Well, what does that allow, what does that allow the recruiter to do? It allows you to have actually a lot of free time to then go and personalize the process to take maybe that top bid and go ahead and start like calling them up, farming them out to the right people, whether it's like a different view of diversity network, and just really, really personalize the process. Uh, because you have free time. So I feel like one of the big issues in recruiting is like it's so ad like heavy. You know, you got a screen, you gotta like change your status, you gotta do that, you know, it's just there's a lot of admins, but if you have that extra time to so like what, what's our job there? Like recruiter. So actually recruit and not just be like the admin, like that's huge. So again, there's all and if you have this extra time, what can you do? You can start to engage with the candidates, you can engage with your business, you can make sure you're going after the right sources. So it's this whole you know snowball effect that that, uh, that, come, that comes around. So four ways artificial intelligence can help. And so again, well, I guess I went ahead and said my slide earlier, but like literally, you know, we joke around this, but this is too. It's like one day, people may really say, like in a court of law, like, what do you mean on the computer? Like, make the decision. I mean, think about it. So one of my colleagues is supposed to be here today, um, but his uh, plane had uh, engine trouble, uh, and so. What what happened? You know, was it the pilot that decided? No, it was the computer that probably like flagged something that was like, "Hey, engine trouble! Don't take off!" You know, and so we think about like all these different ways. Right now, it's like again, a plane crashes. What they do? You know, like oh, did the pilot override the controls of the computer? And so it, we're very much about like, why would you override the computer? We think about that in a lot of different ways right now in our life. I mean, you can imagine it, whether it's just a 10 years, 20 years, like how many years from now where literally people are going to look at our recruiting process, our hiring process, and be like, really, can you make that decision? <laughs> like, I mean, we're, we're not there yet, but like, you can see a world where we really could be there um, and not so far away. Um, it, it was interesting, there was a, um, a lawsuit um, where a company, and I don't, I don't have all the details, but basically a company was using an outdated um, online assessment. Um, that actually had an adverse impact on their candidates. And that because there was like so many online tests that you can take and personal and that this company was using a you know an outdated one. And so they actually had to pay a fine and start using a more update or modern like an online assessment type of tool. So you can see like if the you know courts are starting to say some of this, like you can't have the adverse impact in your selection process, whether that's an online test or whatnot. So you can imagine that you know, those types of things could be, again, sooner rather than later, where they're like, well, you have to use some sort of like unbiased algorithm or something to make some sort of recommendation. So it's, I feel like it's coming sooner than we think. Um, and so just quickly, a lot of people are like, okay, well, you talk, well, what, what could this sort of look like? So this is, again, a screenshot of product candidates' names, and you know, here's the interview probability. So here it's saying Dan, as a 91% you know, probability receiving a uh, you know, interview. And then if you were to like, click into Dan, like it, it shows, well, why? Why does Dan have a 91% interview probability or 75% probability of receiving an offer? And it goes through all, like, the, the, what, what's the big data algorithm looking at? Is it work experience? Is it you know, their education? Is it their you know, test scores? Is it other you know, non quantitative predict like here it has he was captain of the varsity hockey team, you know, test results. So all sorts of like and just to give a sense, because like at first we're not gonna trust some of these algorithms. Like and so that's what we see a lot of concern to use. Like, like use this, see what the prediction is, understand why, and then okay, do your regular selection process. But then like see, did the algorithm say what you guys ended up like choosing? And so it's sort of this interesting, like let it like see how it goes, like to so use the word pilot. I like pilot, pilot. So that's what we have a lot of our clients starting to do. But this is this is the future that's sort of coming. So um, and what I always like to say is like think of this again as a recommendation algorithm. So this is my I took this um, my screenshot last night. <laughs> this is my Amazon recommendation. I have a daughter who's in kindergarten and a third grade son. So clearly my third grader is really into Beyblades, so it's recommending I like buy more Beyblades movies on Amazon. And my daughter, well, I've been buying for some of these like, you know, I'm Jane Goodall and like women in science kind of thing. So, you know, it, it, these are good and well, I was doing some cooking and I may have just recently been watched Twilight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so 
not bad. It's fine. So again, like really good recommendations from Amazon. So again, like think about you know about them. so there we go. So that's you know quick you know my story for uh, well no, sorry, sorry sorry but so then try to get this one more engagement with uh, Amazon. You know your tenants to be more engaged with you and you know so. so thank you. Let's talk about big data. Questions, comments, like you guys using this is crazy. So a question is, um, if if a company isn't yet recruiting at a school or um, hasn't hired certain types of diverse candidates, where does the data come to tell them that that candidate might have a 38% chance of getting an offer? That's a great question. So I'll repeat it for those on the um, live stream. So basically, if you haven't recruited at a school before, you know, where does the algorithm get? You know, get its data from. So we have a, a you know, a, it's obviously an index that looks at. Oh, there's all sorts of open source. You know, when we go out to LinkedIn and we can understand where people moved and, and whatnot. So you know, for us, we have this index that can just be overlaid um, on our on our client system. Um, and what's interesting is then the view is okay. Let's you know use that, see how it goes. You know, and then the following year starts to take more of your, you know custom internal data, talk about like performance and see how people are doing your company and you can then tweak the algorithm. But we have a base one that we've developed. Um, and again, other companies out there have things like this as well where they have their, you know, base index or whatnot and then you use that and then, you know, some allow you to customize it, some don't. So I think that's that's huge is like, um, you know, big data is, is bigger than just because it has to have so many data points and whatnot. It has to be bigger than just one organization. You have to have a lot of information to develop it. So that's, that's what I would say. It's look for companies that have something you can use right away. So this is kind of a, a different question, but uh, I was doing that. We were making a kind of effort to try to structure the algorithm from bad biases and whatnot. Or not, because I mean, you just use outcomes as a data, you're just going to be reaffirming existing mechanisms, right? So you're just going to be looking yeah. at the same school or something, and that's the plan to do. You like purposefully exactly. go through your algorithm and say, yeah. you're going to remove biases. Yeah, so, yeah, we have all these data scientists who, who are thinking, working, and I don't even understand what they're saying. How is that? Uh, but yeah, I mean, and I think that's, I think that's important because if you put, if you build an algorithm on bad process or bad selection, then it just, perpetuates that bias selection process. You have to. You have to fine tune all that out to make sure that it's not just based on bad, you know, existing outcomes. Right. So that's, think that yeah. because I mean Facebook has yeah. a problem with the new speed, right? I mean right. they say yeah, but you're gonna keep you if you make a bunch of bad choices or you spend on Amazon for that matter, right. you get a bunch exactly. of bad recommendations that might be exactly. from an objective perspective bad. So how do you protect against that? How do you how do you help customers avoid that choice? So, yeah. yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, that's well, that's one of the reasons why we had our data scientists, you know, create a standard index because it takes out all those biases, and then it's working, and then it's working with with clients and others throughout the org, not just recruiting for everyone to understand. Okay, as you fine tune it, don't fine tune it to an organization that has a bad bias process. So that that's that's the key. So we're just rolling this out. So we'll, you know, there that we continue to, to look at, but we have to have to take all that like, can. You know, it's like what is that? Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so, maybe it's time for one more. I'm getting the hook. So no, no, I'm. Oh, that's not the hook. Sorry, no hook. <laughs> but um, not the hook yet. Um, one of the uh, one of the things I think that's hard is. Um, it really depends on your organization and how sophisticated you are in the ways that you're hiring. And some of the questions people were asking about, um, you know, just the opportunity to go to different schools. I think the key is to start thinking in terms of data. And that was one clear message throughout today is that the more you can have concrete data to look at and then to go to your hiring managers or to go to your bosses to say, you know, here's the proof that, for instance, if I, the people that I hired from the state school actually are longer term employees who work very hard and are passionate about what they do, 
And when we hired someone from MIT, they stay for a year because they have lots and lots of options. So you know, there's that you can find a lot of that in your data. And what we found is that it's not data that's always being collected even right now. It's, it takes time and it takes um, the idea of making sure you have the data. So I think that that might be a place to start for some of the smaller organizations before, you know, to not be overwhelmed by this idea of big data, uh, you know, eventually, I mean, eventually you'll get to it, but you know, that might be a way to step in, just like we're talking about piloting too. Step in the water by getting some hardcore data in your own organization and talking to maybe your peers about some of their data um, and just starting to get comfortable with it, you know. I would add also to to bring back, to really evaluate what it takes to be successful in a role. Because anyone who's ever been on a hiring team has had that conversation where you look through a resume together and somebody says, well, you know, I don't like that they've written this because that means they are X, Y, Z. That's a proxy. And you have to be careful of identifying proxies versus real indicators. And that has to be part of the, the conversation when if you work with someone, on, um, on building that algorithm. Are you identifying proxies or are you identifying real indicators of success? And, and I would add, um, as, the, as the employment lawyer in the room, um, and to, I'll cover this in my presentation too, that the, the indicators really should be job related to the mm -hmm. specific position that the person is considered for and the specific skills that the position requires and responsibilities and duties of that position. That's great. Thanks, Jeanette. Okay, thank you.